Hi there, welcome back to Mysteries Channel. Thank you for clicking on my video. I really do appreciate it. Today's video is about how over time, history and fact turn into myth and legend. And this topic is interesting because when we review what is now considered myth and legend, a piece of us feels like it's completely ridiculous to think that it could ever have been anything but that, right? Especially the further back you go. The gods that from heaven to earth came, the soap opera that is the ancient pantheon, and the craziness that ensues, the wars that almost all continents had with giants, the mysteries of the flood myths that abound in most ancient cultures. And you think, man, well, at least myself, I think, man, there is no way any of that's true. It's just too bizarre. But then you look at what is left of architecture, what's been written on temples and monuments around the world, and the oral traditions that have been passed down on every continent, and slowly you think, man, maybe. So today we're going to go over another one of those, another legend, much like Troy once was. And it's funny because I came across it in Herodotus and I had never heard of it before. So like a dummy, I thought no one else in the world probably ever heard of it either. Then I proceeded to Google Earth it and thought, I'm going to find it. I'm going to be the one that finds one of these things because you hear of other people doing it. I'm going to do this too. And then lo and behold, somebody else has already found it. They found it a while ago, presumably. And what was talked about as myth for several hundred years turns out to be historical fact. The ancient labyrinth of Egypt, believed until recently to be nothing more than a myth, the great ancient labyrinth of Egypt may have actually existed. In fact, there's ample evidence that this labyrinth existed, so let's go over some of this. Like I said, I came across this in the histories by Herodotus, but found other accounts of witnesses of it as well. So we'll go over these accounts of old. I'm going to go from the oldest to the newest accounts, starting with Herodotus, obviously. So I'll link the books below in the description box if you're interested in reading it for yourselves. Now Herodotus. This is why he says the labyrinth was constructed. Being set free after the reign of the priest Hephaestus. Now Hephaestus was the Greek god of blacksmiths, metalworking, carpenters, craftsmen, artisans, sculptors, metallurgy, fire, and volcanoes. It's important to note that when ancient authors are telling of the deed, of Egypt, it seems like they always use the names that they were familiar with for these. I don't believe that the Egyptians worshipped a Greek god. Hephaestus was also known to the Romans as Vulcan, and possibly he may be Ptah to the Egyptians. The Egyptians, since they could not live any time without a king, set up over them 12 kings, having divided all of Egypt into 12 parts. These made intermarriages with one another and reigned, making agreement that they would not put down one another by force nor seek to get an advantage over one another, but would live in perfect friendship. Moreover, they resolved to join all together and leave the memorial of themselves. And having so resolved, they caused to be made a labyrinth situated a little bit above the Lake Moeris and nearly opposite to that which is called the City of Crocodiles. They would have called it Crocodileopolis in Greece. Now the city of crocodiles nowadays is located 62 miles southwest of Cairo. It was originally in Egypt called Shadet and now is the city of Fayum. Lake Moeris is an ancient lake about 50 miles southwest of Cairo. In prehistory, it was a giant freshwater lake with an area estimated to be between 490 and 656 square miles. Now here, I'm gonna show you this little map here. This is the map of that ancient Lake Moeris, present day, a smaller saltwater body called Berket Karan, which is now you can see the small portion up here. That is what is left of this once enormous lake. The current area of the lake looks to be about 78 miles presently, so it's dropped quite a bit. Okay, first Herodotus. And remember, Herodotus was alive between 484 and 425 BC, so we know it existed then and it was finished before he makes it there. But now Herodotus says that he saw the labyrinth himself and this is what he says that he saw. And I quote, this I saw myself, and I found it greater than words can say. For if one should put together and reckon up all the buildings and all the great works produced by the Hellenes, which are the Greeks now, they would prove to be inferior in labor and expense to this labyrinth. Though it is true that both the temple at Ephesos and at Samos are works worthy of note. The pyramids were also greater than words can say. Each one of them is equal to many works of the Hellenes, great as they may be, but the labyrinth surpasses 
even the pyramids. Then he goes on. It has 12 courts covered in, with gates facing one another, six upon the north side and six upon the south side, joining onto one another. And the same wall surrounds them all outside. And there is two kinds of chambers, the one kind below the ground and the other above these. 3,000 in number of each kind, 1,500. The upper set of chambers we ourselves saw going through them. And we tell of them having looked upon them with our own eyes, but the chambers under the ground we only heard about. For they are the sepulchers of the kings who first built this island and of the sacred crocodiles. A sepulcher is a small room or monument cut into rock that is used as a tomb. And the reason why there are crocodiles in there is because Crocodile Opolis or Shadet at the time had a crocodile that was worshipped in the lake. And so once this crocodile was tamed, it was fed by all the pilgrims that would come to see it and the priests that lived there. And then once he died, he would be entombed beneath this labyrinth and a new crocodile would be put in his place, also trained, tamed to live the good life. Accordingly, we speak of the chambers below by what we receive from hearsay, while those above we saw ourselves and found them to be works more than human greatness. For the passages through the chambers and the goings this way and that way through the courts, which were admirably adorned, afforded endless matter for marvel. As we went through from court to chambers beyond it, and from chambers to colonnades, and from colonnades to other rooms, and then from chambers again to other courts, over the whole of these is a roof made of stone like the walls, and the walls are covered in figures carved upon them, each court being surrounded with pillars of white stone fitted together most perfectly. And at the end of this labyrinth, by the corner of it, there is a pyramid of 40 fathoms upon which the large figures are carved. And to this, there is a way made underground. Such is this labyrinth, but a cause for marvel even greater than the labyrinth is afforded by the lake, which is called Lake Moeris, along the side of which this labyrinth is built. The measure of its cubit is 3,300 furlongs, and this is the same number of furlongs as extent of Egypt itself along the sea. The lake lies extended likewise from north to south, and in depth where it is deepest, it is 50 fathoms. That this lake is artificial and formed by digging is self-evident, for about it in the middle of the lake stand two pyramids, each rising above the water at a height of 50 fathoms. Part which is below the water is of just the same height, and upon each is placed a colossal statue of stone sitting upon a chair. Thus the pyramids are a great hundred fathoms high. The water in the lake does not come from the place where it is, for the country there is very deficient in water. But it has been brought thither from the Nile by a canal, and for six months the water flows into the lake, and for six months it flows out of the lake. The natives of this place said that this lake had an outlet underground to the Sirtis, which is in Libya, turning towards the interior of the continent upon the western side and running along by the mountains, which is above Memphis. Thus, this is how this lake is said to have been dug out. Now, 12 kings continued to rule justly, but in course of time it happened thus. After the sacrifice in the temple of Hephaestus, they were about to make libation on the last day of the feast. And the chief priest, in bringing out for them the golden cups with which they had been wont to pour libations, missed his reckoning and brought 11 only for the 12 kings. Semeticus, since he had no cup, took his helmet off his head, which was of bronze, and having held it out to receive the wine, he proceeded to make libation. Likewise, all the other kings were wont to wear helmets, and they happened to have them now. Now, Sidmetichus held out his helmet with no treacherous meaning, but they had taken note of that which had been done by Sidmetichus and of the oracle, namely how it had been declared to them that whoever of them should make libation with a bronze cup should be sole king of Egypt. Recollecting, I say, the saying of the oracle, they did not indeed deem it right to slay Sidmetichus, since they found by examination that he had not done it with any forethought. Now, if Semeticus rings a bell to you, it's because I just brought him up about two videos ago in the origin of language video. He is the pharaoh that did the first psychological experiment left on record. So I just had to keep reading till I got to that part. Okay, so that is Herodotus' account. Now this account is from a person named Diodorus Siculus. He is another ancient Greek writer and this is what he writes. And a little above the city, he cut a dike for a pond, bringing it down in length from the city, 305 and 20 furlongs, whose use was admirable and the greatness of the work incredible. When one had entered the sacred enclosure, one found a temple surrounded by columns, 
40 to each side, and this building had a roof made of a single stone carved with panels and richly adorned with excellent paintings. It contained memorials of the homeland of each of the kings as well as the temples and sacrifices carried out in it, all skillfully worked in painting and of the greatest beauty. The king left a place in the middle of the lake where he built a sepulcher and two pyramids, one for himself and another for his queen, a furlong in height. Upon the top of each, he placed two marble statues seated in a throne, designing by these monuments to perpetuate the fame and the glory of his name to all succeeding generations. And these are the things which the Egyptians relate of Miris. He calls it Miris, but it's Moeris for Herodotus. It's now Miris. After the king's death, the Egyptians recovered their liberty and set upon a king of their own nation to rule over them. Mendes, this is the problem with names, Mendes turns into Smendes, and now it's in Mendes. He was also called Maris by some, who never undertook any warlike design, but made a sepulcher for himself called a labyrinth, not to be admired so much for its greatness, but for its absolute remarkable workmanship. For he that went in could not come out again without a very skillful guide. Some say that the Daedalus who came to Egypt admired the curiosity of his work and made a labyrinth for King Minos of Crete, copied from the one in Egypt, in which they fabulously relate that the Minotaur was kept. But the one in Crete either came to ruin by some other kings or came to nothing through the length of time. But that in Egypt continued whole and entire in our day. Now the last one I have is the Greek scholar Strabo, who was an ancient geographer, philosopher, historian. He also claims to have seen it with his own eyes. He says, Lake Moeris, by its magnitude and depth, is able to sustain the superabundance of water which flows into at the time of the rise of the Nile without overflowing the inhabited and cultivated parts of the country. But in addition, on both mouths of the canal are placed locks by which these engineers store up and distribute the water which enters or issues from the canal. We have here also a labyrinth, a work equal to the pyramids and adjoining to it the tomb of the king who constructed the labyrinth. He says Alue, Alule, which I'm not really sure, are opposite to the wall. In front of the entrances are kept long and numerous covered ways with winding passages communicating with each other so that no stranger could find his way in or out without a guide. The most surprising circumstance is that the covered ways through their whole range were roofed in the same manner with a single slab of stone of extraordinary size without the intermixture of timber or any other material. At the end of the building, which occupies more than a stadium, is a tomb, which is a quadrangular pyramid about four plethora in length and of equal height. The name of the person buried in this is Amandes. So now I want to go over this map here. I kind of did a little highlight and I would love to zoom in on it, but it has terrible resolution. This shows right here, this is the Sirtis. Now it doesn't give you a definite border for where Libya is, but in real life right now, I want to say that the Sirtis is on the Libyan side. Now all the way over here, and it's very hard to see, but you will see the word labyrinth right here. This is the lake that once was, it's already very small. And like I said, I went on to Google Earth and while I was on there, I found a pyramid. I thought, oh my gosh, that's interesting. And then I came across some information, information that's not widely publicized. And since this maybe even should have made it as one of the seven wonders of the world, because everyone that saw it said it's either equal to or greater than the pyramid. And the lake, everyone that saw this lake was completely and utterly astonished at what they could achieve, right? So remember how I said that it may have been found? Well, results of the expedition were published in 2008, shortly after the discovery in the scientific journal of the NRIAG, and the results of the research were exchanged in a public lecture at the University of Ghent, which media from Belgium attended. But the finding was quickly suppressed since the Secretary General of the Supreme Council's of antiquities in Egypt put a hold on all further communications about the discovery due to the Egyptian national security sanctions. Louis Cordier, the lead researcher of the expedition, waited patiently for two years for the Supreme Council to acknowledge the findings and make them public. Regrettably, it never happened. In 2010, De Cordier, opened a website. The website is Labyrinth of Egypt in order to make the discovery available to the entire world. The craziest part is this site was found even well before then. It was found in 1843 by William Petrie, but it became famous for something else at that point in time. It became famous for Roman death portraits. Here's some pictures of these death portraits that came out of the pyramid and 
What he found is called the Pyramid of Amenemhat III at Hawara. The majority of the interior of the pyramid and complex are underwater, making it closed to the public. But damn, somebody send these people a pump. So what happened? That's right. It was, well, let's just say it was appropriated, right? Interestingly, this is how things are forgotten over and over and over again. This is how fact becomes myth and legend. In an effort to get the population to fall into line and adopt a new system of power, a multi-pronged approach is involved. Taking anything of value and shipping it out and destroying anything that's left that's culturally significant. And this is how the labyrinth was lost. Chances are very high they didn't destroy it, they let it fall into ruin, or they covered it up completely so that nobody could remember the kings that once were. Remember how I brought up Semeticus? Something happens with him. It gets pretty dicey the more you look at the ancient pharaohs. Semeticus is known, not just for the psychological experiment, but he is known for uniting all of Egypt again. It almost feels like there is this weird break in history. I think I talked about it before. Um, historical negationism. There might have been something like that going on because we have three different accounts from three different historians that talk to the guides and priests at that place. I am more likely to trust Herodotus, but I think he is wrong as well. I don't even think it was Semeticus. I actually think the labyrinth is older. So anyway, let's go on to the Google Earth portion. Okay, I am not very good at Google Earth, so I'm gonna apologize now and just warn you, I'm trying. <laughs> I swear, but I had to look at this compared to what was left of the old maps that we talked about and also compared to what Herodotus said and the other historians. Possibly this is all the lake, which that would be impressive. But then you see this weirdness that goes all the way around here too. I don't know. And does that not look like there was some kind of draining possibly? I don't know. Maybe it's just the sands being blown around. What did Herodotus say? He said it was bigger than the length of the border of Egypt's border on the sea. So let's see if we can measure that out. We have about 480 miles. Now let's measure out what might be the smaller portion of the lake and see if that's what it is. Not even close. There's 129 miles. We know that's not even close. So let's do this bigger portion here and see if it's anywhere close. And it's hard to see. Look at that. That's not close either. Let's try again. See if we can figure this out. Well, that is closer to the border and it does exceed the border of Egypt along the sea, but it also seems like it's a little big. Maybe if I do this instead. Okay, let's try this again. All right, let's measure this large portion that looks like it might've once been underwater. 655 miles, I don't know. I'm thinking that it might've actually been that large, but without knowing what Egypt's border was at that point in time for sure, but I don't think it's that far off from where it is now. This might've actually been the size of the lake. It's hard to say for sure. And then let's look at the pyramid that they believe is tied to the labyrinth. This is what it looks like now. As you get closer, this is what it looks like from above. And then as you zoom in, You see this? I mean, it doesn't make sense because it does say that the labyrinth had a stone covering above it, but maybe it fell down, but it does look like there is some kind of square grid work and it continues out to here. It looks like that's one square. And then as you go over here, there's more, but it's really hard to say. In fact, look at that. Goes all the way around and there's some type of line there, so. Maybe yes, maybe no. I don't know. That's all I found on here. Anyway, as always, I want to say thank you for clicking on my channel and you guys have yourselves a very great day.